A lot of people. Well done. Um, testing one, two, three. That's kind of where part of it is where I thought the rest of them. Good evening. Welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started. Am I on? Okay. Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Directors meeting of Dr. Cog for Wednesday, April 19th, 2023. I'm your chair, Steve Conklin. Thank you for being here tonight. Is this on? Okay. Here it doesn't sound like it's on, but. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, please rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That flag is like totally hidden. Thank you very much. And we will now have a roll call. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Wonderful. Okay. Uh, we'll get started. Adams County, Steve Odoricio. Here. Arapahoe County, Jeff Baker. Here. Boulder County, Claire Levy. City and County of Broomfield, Austin Ward. Here. Clear, County, or Clear Creek County, Randy Wheelock. Thank you. Uh, City and County of Denver, Nicholas Williams. City and County of Denver, Jolong Clark. Here. Douglas County, George Teal. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Gilpin County, Marie Mornis. Jefferson County, Tracy Kraft Tharp. Wonderful. Lisa Smith, City of Arvada. Bob Pfeiffer, City of Arvada. Dustin Zvonek, City of Aurora. Town of Bennett, Larry Vidham. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, City of Boulder. Margo Ramsden, Town of Bomar. Jan Plowski, City of Brighton. Deborah Mulvey, City of Castle Pines. Here. Tim Dietz, Town of Castle Rock. Jason Gray, Town of Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer, City of Centennial. Present. Todd Williams, City of Central. Randy Wheel, City of Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, Craig Hurst, City of Commerce City. Susan Noble, Commerce City. Catherine Whitman, Decono. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Cheryl Wink, Inglewood. Ari Harrison, Erie. Sarah Laughlin, Erie. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. John Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Here. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Here. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Paul Hazeman, Golden. Here. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Here. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Here. Stephanie Walton, Lafayette. Oh. Jeslyn Sherzai, Lakewood. Rich Olver, Lakewood. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Here. Kat Bristow, Lock Bowie. Jacqueline White, Lock Bowie. Wynne Shaw, Lone Tree. Joan Peck, Longmont. Here. Dietrich Hoffner, Louisville. Deborah Fahey, Louisville. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Greg Edding, Lyons. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Nederland. Richard Kondo, North Glen. Tim Wong, North Glen. John Dyack, Parker. Here. Sally Daigle, Sheridan. Neil Shaw, Superior. Sandy Hammerly, Superior. Jessica Sandgren, Thornton. 
Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Bruce Baker, Westminster. Bud Starker, Wheat Ridge. Glad to be here. Darius Pakbaz, CDOT. Here. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. Here. Okay, and with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Great, thank you very much, and thanks for the great attendance, and uh, <coughs> awesome. Appreciate y'all being here tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, before we move ahead to approve the agenda, I want to make note that item number five, the presentation on the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, uh, is canceled slash postponed. Uh, we will not have that tonight. So if I can get a motion to approve the amended agenda, I would appreciate that. So moved. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. And any abstentions? Okay, we have an agenda. Thank you. Uh, with that, we will move ahead to the report of the chair, and I will ask for a report from the Performance and Engagement Committee, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We met uh, immediately before this meeting. We had three items on our agenda to discuss. Uh, we elected, uh, congratulations, Director uh, Austin Ward from as the vice chair for performance and engagement. We got an update from Director Rex on the 2023 board retreat that's coming up. And we had a robust discussion on the um, board of directors meeting participation options, virtual, in-person, um, and we, Director Rex, quite a bit of information to noodle for a while and <coughs> maybe get back with us later on. That's my report, Mr. Chair. Hey, thank you very much. And report for the Finance and Budget Committee, Director Whitlow. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, we had more than three items tonight on our agenda. Got a bunch um, of items. Yes, today. we did. We <laughs> elected a vice chair, Neil Shaw, from represented um, from Superior. So congratulations on Neil, who's flying around N Nebraska somewhere. So. We uh, all told tonight to Neil. So thank you, Director Shaw, for stepping up. Um, we did a numerous amount of uh, resolutions tonight, um, authorizing the executive director to negotiate, um, uh, executive, uh, excuse me, to execute a contract with FHU to create a multimodal corridor plan for Alameda Avenue and not to exceed the amount of $300,000. The next one was to negotiate and execute a contract by our executive director to, uh, with, I'm going to pass name up here, and peers to create a multimodal corridor plan for South Boulder Road from Boulder to Glafayette in the amount not to exceed $200,000. The next one we did a resolution to authorize the executive director to negotiate and execute a contract with HDR not to, in, in the amount not to exceed $125,000 for an on-call grant writing services to support Dr. Cog's efforts to apply for a federal grant. Very exciting. The next was a resolution authorizing the executive director to accept approximately $20 million, $20.5 million from the Colorado Department of Human Services to allocate approximately $13.5 million to AAA service providers for the period starting this year, July 1st, and ending next year, June 30th of 2023. Um, next is also, we have a, a resolution authorizing the executive director to enter into agreement with the Federal Transit Administration for approximately $3.4 million for the period beginning July 1st of this year, ending September 30th of next year, to allocate approximately $3.1 million to projects beginning July 1st and ending June 30th next year, pending approval of tonight's consent agenda. Okay, and the next, then the last one is a, uh, a resolution authorizing the executive director to allocate approximately $3 million to Older Americans Act state funding for senior services, funds to transportation projects as recommended for the period of July of this year to June 30th, 2024, pending approval of tonight's consent agenda. And sir, that concludes my report. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Uh, report of the Executive Director, Doug Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and good evening, everybody. Um, so, who's ready for a board retreat? Can't wait, May 12th, 13th, all right. That's what I'd like to hear. 
No, thank you. Uh, as as um, as Director Baker pointed out earlier, we had a conversation that performs an engagement. I just want to give you a couple quick updates on that. You should have all received an invitation to RSVP for, for that event. Um, if you haven't, please let us know. So we'll send that out. We'll be sending out plenty of reminders. You know what we're like. Um, but we are, so Friday night is reserved for a social and dinner, and it's going to be held at the Renaissance Hotel, which is basically caddy corner to where we are here tonight. Um, we're excited about that. We think it's a great room, and I think you'll, you'll really enjoy it as well. We're still working on a keynote for, for that event. Um, if you have any ideas, we're still open, but we do have a couple of ideas that we're, we're, we're floating around. Um, we are offering the opportunity for you to bring a guest to that meeting, or, sorry, to, to the dinner. But of course, they can come to a retreat on Saturday, too, if they so desire. Um, uh, so, but if you are planning on bringing someone, please be sure to fill out that section of the registration so that we can get an accurate count for dinner. And let me see here. Oh, we also we have a block of rooms reserved at the Renaissance in the event you, you uh, would like to stay overnight and just walk across the street the next morning for the board retreat. Um, also, we will have validated parking Friday night in this building. Um, so again, it's a pretty easy walk. And, and if you do decide to stay at the hotel, you can leave your car here overnight. We just need a little bit of information about, about the vehicle make and model and all that kind of good stuff. So, um, please plan to attend. Uh, I, you know, I, we're really excited about the agenda this year. It is very housing heavy in a lot of respects, but I think it's, it, it will lead to some really, really good conversations. Staff has been working tremendously hard to finalize the agenda, and I do want to thank Melinda for the work that she's doing on the, lo on the logistics side to, to make sure everything flows the way that we all hope that it will flow. Right, Melinda? Absolutely. There you go. All righty. So a uh, small communities hot topics forum. So we've been doing this a number of years now, primarily for, as it suggests, our smaller communities. The next event will be held on Thursday, May 4th. Um, you should have received a save the date some time ago, but uh, registration uh, will open um, tomorrow. So we'll be sending a separate email tomorrow, I believe, to, uh, to get you all registered up. And um, so please plan to attend that. I think we're working on a very good agenda. I think one of the topics is broadband. I'm looking for Flo. I don't see her in the room. Uh, broadband and I think IIJA grant opportunities that are available. Um, as you may know, we've hired um, a grants, an IIJA grants navigator. We were um, um, we get, we received some money through through OEDIT to to hire a grants navigator for for this one year. So we're excited to roll that out and get you all involved and communicate that. And hopefully we can we can get some of that federal money. Uh, speaking of IIJA, uh, the Colorado Office of Economic Development and International Trade, OEDIT, uh, will be holding a regional uh, IIJA, good Lord, IIJA summit for the Dr. Cog region on Monday, May 22nd. Everybody is invited to attend the, the, uh, this event, and information about registration will be forthcoming from OEDIT. Um, if you're interested, again, in some of that federal money, it's probably a good, a good, good idea for you or your staff to attend that. Let me see, Civic Academy. Um, so we, we kicked off our Civic Academy, our spring session of the Civic, Civic Academy last night in this very room. Um, the, the kickoff session was, was, a, was a hosted panel discussing, uh, th focused on regionalism. I had the opportunity to give a, to give a presentation on what we do here at Dr. Cog, Mike Silverstein from the, the executive director of, of the Regional Air Quality Council was also involved, as well as Monica Bulick from Adams County Health. Um, who was representing Metro Denver Partnership for Health. Um, so we have 35 participants in this class, and uh, they had a lot of great questions and eager to learn, so it was wonderful. Uh, last but not least, Mr. Chairman, uh, Bike to Work Day is fastly approach, fast approaching. Um, the registration is now open, so uh, you'll be hearing some more details in Nisha's presentation later on this evening. Um, but I just wanted to give you my personal invitation to participate in that and help promote that event. We're obviously very proud of it. Um, it's the second largest of its kind in the country. We typically get 30, 35,000 participants. So it's a big deal, and it's a great opportunity to, um, to uh, you know, uh, uh, for first timers. Typically, first timers are about 30 percent of the of the total participants, and it's an opportunity for basically to change habits, right? 
and uh, give bicycling a try. So we, we appreciate anything you can do. I will also say at the May board meeting, um, we will have some order sheets available for the veterans on here. You know that we, we order T-shirts and hats, and we make them free to you all. You just, we just need your sizes and all that kind of good stuff. There's also uh, Bike to Work Day posters on the credenza over here. We have mini ones as well as some larger ones if you're uh, willing to take those and, and uh, post them in, in your uh, community chamber. Not, not necessarily in the chamber, but in, the, in your county buildings. That would be great. Or city buildings. Community buildings. I will stop there, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir, very much. Fantastic report. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we will move ahead to public comments. Any public comment tonight? All right, well, we move ahead to the consent agenda, uh, asking for a motion to approve the consent agenda, which includes a summary of the April 5th uh, meeting and the July 2023 June 24 HST FTA 5310 and OAA projects as discussed, which were approved at the uh, FMB meeting earlier. Mr. Pulowski. Second. Uh, well, uh, Director Pulaski moved and uh, Director Vidim seconded. Uh, uh, all in favor of approving the consent agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Thank you very much. With that, we will move ahead to the action items. Uh, we'll start with a discussion of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Climate Pollution Reduction Grant, or CPRG, program, and we'll turn it over to Robert Spots, Manager of the Transportation and Planning and Operations. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening. Um, to make it clear, I'm just a manager within transportation and planning and operations. I'm not the manager of, <laughs> even though Ron's not here tonight. Uh, yeah, it was, there was a coup while he was gone. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, we're here to discuss um, EPA's Climate Re Pollution Reduction Grant, or CPRG. Uh, we brought this to you at the special board meeting um, instead of the board, board section a couple weeks ago. As a reminder, um, as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, EPA was given $5 billion um, to help assist local and uh, state agencies in developing um, climate action plans as well as implementing the strategies contained within those plans. On March 1st, they announced how they're going to go about this. Phase one of the plan is to um, distribute planning grants uh, to states, uh, tribes, territories, and then $1 million to each of the 67 most populous metropolitan areas or me metropolitan statistical areas. So the Denver, Aurora, Lakewood metropolitan statistical area is about the 18th largest one of those. So the region or the city will be getting a $1 million grant. There is no rat match or cost share requirement on those funds. That leads to some planning work. And by doing that planning work, it makes you eligible to apply for $4.6 billion in competitive implementation grants. So that's real money to develop projects um, in the ground within our region, cities, and state. Um, the, how that money is going to be distributed is still under um, consideration at EPA. There's the potential that there could be very large grants as high as $100 million. Uh, the, the, the requirements of the planning grant itself, there's three stages to it. So happening rather quick by March 1st of 2024, a priority climate action plan is due. Um, and that is meant to have kind of some shovel-ready projects contained within that plan so that you can apply for those grants which start rolling out in the first quarter of 2024. Uh, a, a more comprehensive plan, the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan, due two years from the time you receive the um, grant funds and then a status report two years after that. Um, so in, in the near term, we've been talking with our local partners about the best way to utilize this funding that's coming to the city or, or and or region. Um, uh, we've established kind of uh, a, a, a group, a mailing list to distribute the uh, folks that may be interested in participating in this process. By April 28th, so nine days from today, one agency does need to submit a notice of intent to participate, and that will declare who the lead agency for the region is. 
By May 31st, an application is due to EPA. That includes items such as the budget for that $1 million, the work plan, and a bunch of other paperwork. Um, because Dr. Cog's boundary matches the metropolitan statistical, statistical area, we have um, organizational goals to reduce greenhouse gases. We have a history of supporting local agencies, bringing us together at the table. We feel like it makes sense for Dr. Cog to be the lead agency for this project. Denver, Lakewood, and Aurora, have their mayors have all submitted letters of support for Dr. Cog to be the lead agency. Um, and, you know, critically, this puts us in a position to be able to apply for those nearly $5 billion of implementation grants. Um, so, a brief timeline, here we are tonight, um, considering your approval of a resolution for the executive director to submit this notice of intent to participate. Um, that's due by the 28th, no reason to wait until then if you all approve this, this, this motion this evening. By May 31st, that grant is due. That would lead to um, planning efforts um, from your, your staff, uh, sustainability staff or others that want to participate and have the time to participate in this effort. Um, we would update the board as necessary throughout this process. And that priority cl climate action plan that's due on March 1st would come back to you for approval on February 21st of 2024. So with that, um, I'm th the proposed motion is before you and I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Dr. Odorizio. Can you hear me? Oh. Um, so if we weren't to say Dr. Cog, who else would lead the effort in the region? So t technically the city of Denver as the largest city within the MSA has the authority to claim the money um, if there was a dispute about who should lead the effort. And they have offered that should you choose not to approve this proposal, Denver would lead the effort within the region. Any other questions? Seeing none, do we have a motion? Stark. Sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I move to adopt a resolution authorizing the executive director to submit a notice of intent to participate Environmental Protection Agency designated the Denver Regional Council of Governments as the lead agency and grant recipient for the Denver Aurora Lakewood Metropolitan Statistical Area Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. Second. Second. Not here, so. <laughs> all in favor, any further discussion first? Okay, seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? And any abstentions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and you're welcome for that brief promotion that I gave you that you're here. <laughs> <laughs> we will move on to a definite hot topic discussion on state legislative issues. We'll start with bills on which positions have previously been taken, and we'll turn it over to Rich Morrow, Director of Legislative Affairs. Mr. Morrow. That's okay. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> um, I just, yeah, okay. So I just want to call your attention to the piece in the packet on the bills that we've taken positions on before. It updates the status of those bills. Um, there's not, really nothing else new from what went out a week ago. So um, I'll just see if there's any questions about any of that. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to Sheila and Andy to give an update on the one bill you're probably the most interested of the bills that you've taken a position on already, and that's Senate Bill 213. All right. So if there's no questions on the other bills, I'll just turn it over to Sheila. Okay, great. Thank you all. Um, thanks, Rich. Um, so we thought it would be really helpful this evening to return to you to provide some highlights on Senate Bill 213. We were here two weeks ago discussing it with you. Um, I'm sure, as you all have been tracking this, the Senate Committee on Housing and Local Government reviewed it yesterday and approved 18 amendments. And the reason I mention this is that that was less than 24 hours ago. So we are doing our best to get the analysis together for you. Um, but our analysis is really ongoing. So if we miss something or if there's something that doesn't resonate with you, please chime in because perhaps you have the more up-to-date information. 
All right. So when we um, spoke to you last time, we shared about the different geographies that are in this bill. Um, tier one, urban municipalities, tier two, urban municipalities, um, rural resort municipal or rural resort job centers and non-urban municipalities. This is a map that we created for you two weeks ago. As we understand it based on amendments that we heard yesterday, um, the way that population is now determined for the bill, um, they'll be using the um, reports from the state demographer's office. And so that may adjust the population sizes in some of our communities, perhaps one or two. So this map might change slightly. And we just wanted to draw that to your attention. So the housing needs assessment, um, there's still uh, a plan in the bill to develop a statewide, a regional and local assessment. DOLA will develop a methodology in consultation with the state demographer's office. And then there'll be a multi-agency committee that will advise and provide recommendations on that methodology. We wanted to call out that some, there have been some changes to the multi-agency committee. Um, that membership has been expanded. So originally it was executive directors from I believe four different um, uh, departments of the state. And now they've expanded the membership to include two staff level representatives from MPOs, two from um, urban municipalities, two from rural uh, resort job centers, one county representative, one housing expert, expert that will come from the community. And then they've created two subcommittees, a rural resort area subcommittee and an urban area subcommittee. And then there was an additional amendment that provided clarifications on how appointments will, be, will occur, ensuring that app appointments reflect the geographic and demographic diversity in our communities. In addition, okay, we'll keep going. Um, so, the other thing we wanted to call out is that um, the guidance, there's more guidance in the bill now on the method to how to advise the methodology than there was in the, in the previous versions. And so there's um, greater specificity um, in determining the estimation of necessary housing units, um, the greater specificity related to housing types, and then also housing for all income levels. And they're leaning more on established definitions, for example, on income levels or using HUD's definitions. And there's more specificity around job related data and also greater specificity around job, the job housing balance. Uh, specifically, they call out affordable housing and workers who earn lower incomes, that those should be called out more specifically in the assessments. There's also an adjustment to um, measures of homelessness and housing stability. All right, so the housing needs plan. Um, so every urban municipality shall adopt, um, sh sorry, sh shall develop, adopt, and submit a housing needs plan by December 31st, 2026. Um, the process for rural resort job centers has been adjusted a bit, and it doesn't quite mirror what urban municipalities will be following for their housing needs assessment. So that's why we have some red circles on this slide, just pointing that out. There's also an allowance that um, municipalities can opt out if their population is below 25,000 and, and their annual median household income less than 55,000. Um, in addition, um, there was in the uh, bill as introduced, there was a reference to developing a greenfield analysis that has been striked and what it's now called is a buildable lands analysis. What that is, it's a comprehensive analysis of vacant, partially vacant and underutilized land. Um, it will articulate both, um, uh, or, or it, will all, it will call out both green fields, but also brown fields and gray fields. And there's a prioritization that communities really look at gray fields and brown fields wherever possible for development. Um, and there's another provision that um, is important for Dr. Cog, and that is that MPOs must complete a buildable land analysis for their area by December 31st, 2025. 
And the other piece on that is that MPOs must use the buildable land analysis to inform their planning processes, project prioritization, and grant funding. So another amended requirement is that urban municipalities can update their existing housing plan rather than starting a new. Then of course they'll have to see if their existing plan aligns with the bill and if it does not, they'll have to amend that plan. Another amended requirement is that um, the affordable housing strategies that communities will have to consider in the development of their housing needs plan, a lot of, or all of that is now in statute. So they've included a menu in the updated bill. The other thing with, with that is for the affordable housing strategies, um, they have allocated uh, or they've, they've called out that they will provide technical assistance to communities. To, to do that analysis. Another area where there's amendments is the displacement mitigation measures. They've provided greater clarity on mitigation member, measures, calling out the importance of considering displacement risk in the declarations. Um, they've also moved up the timeline um, so that one of the things with the timeline is that they've adjusted many of the timelines in the bill. Part of the intention is to um, align the assessments and needs plans with some of the other provisions in the bill. So there isn't as much of a lag time. In the, as introduced, there was a lag time of almost two years between assessment to, act, or sorry, to adoption of some minimum standards to, to then actually getting an approved housing needs plan. So they tried to make adjustments in different places, and this is one of the places. Um, they provide a greater um, clarity around um, guidance to DOLA will develop a, a displacement assessment guide and they need to consult with community groups who have experience working with individuals who have been displaced or have been at risk of displacement. There's an allowance for municipalities that have already done analysis in this area and who have perhaps adopted mitigation measures to lean on those already adopted measures. Of course, to make sure that they're aligned with what the bill calls out. And also same as the affordability strategies, there is technical assistance for conducting displacement analysis. So a lot on housing needs plans. All right, so this is one area we wanted to just clarify because the last um, presentation we explained to you that there was four major policy areas those being accessory dwelling units, middle housing, transit-oriented areas, and key corridors. And we, um, on the left side of this screen, shows you how the bill laid out as introduced and in what geographies those applied. And as amended, and again, as we understand, because as we dive deeper, we are finding a lot more in this, but accessory dwelling units, um, um, communities would have to adopt minimum standards for accessory dwelling units for tier one, tier two, and non-urban communities. And Andy will go into greater detail. There's also an amendment to an amendment that would indicate that um, in unincorporated uh, parts of the county, they would also be allowed. The, what changed in this bill is that the middle housing transit oriented areas and key corridors they combined into one section, into a single section in the bill. There are still provisions for all three, but they've consolidated that a lot. The biggest change is that the areas where those apply have shrunk consi considerably. Wanted to just touch on process. This is something we explained last time. So the general sequence for how this works is that communities um, would, in these policy areas, they would have to develop their uh, uh, prov provisions or local laws to accommodate them. If a community did not do that, DOLA in the meantime is developing a model code and that model code would eventually go into effect if communities didn't make provisions for these different policy areas. And so that general sequence is the same, but as I mentioned, timelines have been They've attempted to align some of the timelines, but I will point out that the minimum standards would need to be adopted by communities prior to finishing your housing needs plan. So the sequence is still the same. Great, I will pause here.
we are tag teaming this. Andy's going to come up and explain the policy areas further. Mr. Chairman, if I may, just, just I, I just want to let you know that we'll get this presentation out to you all after the meeting. Um, I'm sure staff have been working on this right up until the hour before this. So, um, thank you. Um, yeah. So as Sheila was laying out, uh, there were some changes uh, to the accessory dwelling unit section. Um, not shown on here is the amendment to the amendment that uh, would extend the ADU provisions to unincorporated areas of the county or, um, an or an incorporated area with agricultural zoning. But as it interacts with one of the other definitions that we did not see a change to, uh, the, there's a certain list of parcel types that would be exempt. And one of those are parcels that are outside the census designated area. I wish I had maps on all this, but luckily there's an agenda item that will have more on that uh, to come tonight. So uh, the only minimum zoning standard uh, we noted at the special board meeting um, were the amendments that, again, the amendments changed as to the side and rear setbacks that were in there before. Before it was, uh, it had to be no greater than five feet. Um, and so this would change it to be more in the context of what would already be in that zoning district. So into the corridors and centers components, uh, first with the transit-oriented areas, uh, we did see some uh, changes. Uh, the amount of land that a jurisdiction would need to change uh, zoning for to accommodate uh, this level of density has been cut in half uh, through one of the amendments last night. So there are also some other parcel type exemptions that were added, including industrial sites, airports, and mobile home parks. Uh, the key corridors also saw some changes. Uh, the same tweaks that we saw to the parcel type exemptions are also in this section. Uh, the amendments made sure to tie the areas uh, subject to the minimum zoning changes to the frequent uh, transit service areas. That wasn't the case as introduced. Uh, the density, which was previously um, pushed off to guidance, was actually now specified uh, with some of the amendments. Uh, and uh, jurisdictions can now decide what areas to apply these to, and it has to be equivalent to 25% uh, of that key corridor parcel area. Uh, some of the minimum parking standards also uh, could be um, up below, but previously there was uh, no minimum parking requirement uh, that could be put in place. Now there will be uh, a, a small one uh, as it is in this bill. Uh, for middle housing, our analysis is still uh, continuing, but what we see so far, um, the area these minimum zoning standards would be applied to was also scaled back significantly uh, through this amendment. 30% uh, of the area uh, where single family homes are allowed by right for most subject jurisdictions uh, what could be subject to this uh, jurisdiction to get to choose uh, where to put these middle housing areas. Um, unless they were to let the model code go into effect, uh, and then it would apply within one mile of fixed transit routes uh, where single family homes are allowed by right. Uh, we do also see the same allowance for parking standards as we just saw for key corridors in this area. Uh, other amendments did integrate, um, as Sheila was outlining, the buildable lands analysis into some of the other changes uh, beyond these big four sections. Um, uh, so other changes to statute, uh, it would integrate uh, that buildable housing analysis. Also, we saw some uh, changes to the, the sections in the bill that would change how uh, communities, uh, including how Dr. Cog does its regional plan, uh, to comprehensive plan requirements. There'd be more sections that are required uh, in statute. I think that's all I've got. As you can see, it's been a team effort. There's a lot to go through. All right. So we wanted to, um, to round this out, just highlighting where MPOs are mentioned in the bill. So this slide shows above that blue line. Those are um, places where the bill as introduced had mentioned MPOs, 
below the line are additions that were added with the amendments. Um, I wanted to just highlight again, the MPOs have representation now on the multi-agency committee. Um, another change is that they have called out that regional entities can lead housing needs planning. So I think they're referring to entities like Dr. Cog in that. Technical assistance funding, MPOs are named that that technical assistance funding can pass through MPOs. And then as Andy mentioned, I mentioned earlier, um, there is a provision that MPOs must do a buildable land analysis. The one last thing that I'll mention, one of the amendments yesterday was that there would be a sunset date for this bill. So 10 years out, there would be a sunset date and I guess an opportunity to reassess and see, see what the impact has been. All right, I think that is all. Thank you. <clears throat> wow. Uh, thank you for, for the, the, the efforts to uh, summarize that. Um, I think there are probably still questions, and I think you know, even staff probably has some of those same questions. But let's open it if there are things that you want to get clarity on, if you want to make comments. Uh, do you want to make any comment before we do that? Well, I, I just might say that yeah, yeah, we, we do have still a bunch of questions, right? Which uh, this is our interpretation of what that says. Um, primarily, you know, there was significant changes in the middle housing section, right? And trying to understand exactly what that means. You know, there was a, there's a, there's a, there's a or in there um, related, to, and we're still trying to figure out exactly what that means. And and the stuff related to the buildable net lands analysis, the needs assessment, we're still trying to get some clarity on some of the some of the uh, information that is supposed to be included in that, whether it's even possible to get that level of information. So we're working on that. The other question we have related to the the buildable. Um, lands assessment is, you know, requires MPOs to have that finished by the end of 25, then it requires communities, local government, to have that done a year later. We, our question is, well, why can't local governments just use the regional analysis? Because we're basically aggregating that data up anyway, right? So questions like this. So we sit on a, they have this planning experts group together, and they meet a couple times a week. So those are some of the typical questions we're going to ask, as well as any questions that you all have today that we don't know the answers to. Thank you. Dr. Whitlow. Um, has there any, been any changes to the fiscal note? I hear, I hear from your update that there was money allocated for technical assistance from the MBOs. Was there any allocation of funding for that? Um, I don't know. I believe it's still $15 million. I don't know if there's anyone. Yeah. Still 15 million as stated. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Please. Does it work? A couple questions. Um, one, water. When you have a community that could actually build but doesn't have the water to build, I still haven't heard any answers from anybody on that. And two, I'll just throw out the dreaded, uh, how does this help construction defects or does it do anything? Because you can't build those still to this day. I think I can answer one of those questions about water. There uh, is a provision in there, um, and it went from being uh, an application to be um, uh, due to water availability and application um, to not have these provisions go into effect or, or get some extra time. Um, or, or just stay that. Now it's turned into, in the amendments, a notice. So uh, it's no longer asking for permission. It's just noting and showing some of that information in a form that would still be yet to be determined. Ms. Angren, thank you for that question. Other questions? Dr. Peck. Yes. Is there going to be any money allocated for our transit uh, development? Any money toward transit so that we can actually have transit development? Not as currently proposed. <laughs> Dr. Wheel. Um, I don't mean to imply, I, um, I don't mean to have it imply any uh, endorsement or support of the bill, but we have a situation with it that is as the crow flies. 
residents. And if you're walking, you could talk directly into the mic. We're, we're cutting out here. <clears throat> we have a train station that's half a mile away as the crow flies. On the other hand, where those um, entrance and exits are, you'd have to walk across or bike across I-25, uh, take that half mile trip. It's two and a half miles if you actually use the distance. So is there any clarity on, and they now talked about entrance and exit, but that doesn't address this as the crow flies. Uh, yeah, that was a question we had as well, uh, because there are significant distances uh, in, unless uh, you happen to be a bird. Uh, but uh, there is some flexibility built in so that you can still try and achieve that density um, overall, but it doesn't have to change every single parcel uh, within that area. So that was in there. And then with the 50%, there's more flexibility to have some areas not see those zoning changes. There was also some clarification on jurisdictions only being responsible for what is in their jurisdiction, noting that a lot of these um, half mile rings do go through more than one jurisdiction. Director Starker, then Director Teal. Were there any uh, changes made to the provision that uh, unlimited number of unrelated individuals that may cohabitate in a Residents. Uh, we did not see any amendments to that section. One thing that's bothered me with the uh, transit corridor development um, um, uh, incentives, I didn't say that that way, it, is there any discrimination or is there any definition around a transit corridor planned versus a transit corridor built? Because that's something that it sort of bothered me because, uh, and it came up in a conversation with Director Peck earlier uh, this evening, that we have transit corridors that are planned, but um, are many years away from being built. Uh, yes, the, uh, the transit-oriented areas, uh, those station areas, are just for existing stations, but the key corridors do involve uh, plans that have been adopted, uh, so changes to um, uh, high-frequency routes, uh, additional BRT, bus rapid transit, uh, those would come into play. There are some definition changes that we're still evaluating um, which ones of these plans routes may, uh, may come into uh, the scope of this. Uh, another item we have tried to bring up is that we may have bus rapid transit routes in our regional transportation plan. That doesn't mean we've had the stops identified. And so as the bill references specific stops, um, we wouldn't be able to identify those at this point, even though the uh, lines do exist in our regional transportation plan. Director Levy and then Director Mulvey. This is just a, a clarification. Um, when uh, Sheila um, said that accessory dwelling units would now be allowed in unincorporated Boulder County, uh, alarm signals went off in my head because We've been following it really closely, and I, I hadn't heard about that, and so I, I did pull up the amendment that addresses that, and and it does not allow them. Um, you might reread that so because there there's like a double negative in it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's really difficult because there was yeah there was one amendment that amended. Uh, I, there's a I think it was zero one seven and zero two seven. Zero two seven I believe amended zero one seven before they adopted it. So. Uh, that's where that change was inserted. Okay, well then I haven't read both so, of those together, so I might be mistaken. Uh, 027 would be the one to look at. To, to okay, all right, I'm looking at 028. All right, thanks. Director Mulvey. Um, can't talk. I have two unrelated questions. I represent, I'm one of four that represent Dr. Cog on the Front Range Passenger Rail District, and my first question is whether or not a transit corridor planned, as was just raised, could include front range passenger rail route, corridor, or station. And, and I'll start on that because I, I actually had the language up related to key corridors um, with regards. So um, a corridor, right, you know, 
as defined, is transit service levels as of January 1st, 2023, transit service levels planned and approved by the transit agency as of January 1st, 2023, for implementation before January 1st, 2028, or future transit service levels planned as of January 2023 as described in the federally required transportation plan. So front range passenger rail is not included in the regional transportation plan, right? Um, I don't know that, but um, I believe that um, it may not fit the definitions um, of, of the types of transit that would trigger the key corridors, and the transit-oriented areas is specifically calling out existing stations. So um, my read at this point would be that it, it would not be included. Well, you're, you're right, Andy, um, if I may, Mr. Chairman, because, yeah, but... Key corridors, it really is referring primarily to bus rapid transit and bus service. Um, the transit-oriented areas is related to rail transportation. And there were some changes to the bus rapid transit definition. Um, it was rather uh, loose before where I believe there were, there were several items that needed to be on that uh, to be considered a bus rapid transit. There's uh, a couple versions I've seen, but I think the one that, that uh, was considered last night um, make sure that there are three items in place. So there are items about infrastructure and uh, about frequency and, and that kind of thing. So uh, trying to figure out where that definition applies is also going to be difficult. Thank you. Uh, um, director, I, ha I had that's a right, second that's question. Right. You did have a second question, and you said that, so I apologize. This is my million-dollar question that bugs me a lot. A lot of us have HOA-dense communities. I have 30 of them, and they all have restrictions, and we don't have 30% that's not HOA. So does the bill allow for or mention what happens to the covenants that run with the land in an HOA when these mandates in the new code abrogate them or are different from them? I haven't come across it in the amendments that were considered last night, uh, but I did see a, a draft earlier that was trying to specify that uh, some of the pieces related to planned unit development or HOA would specifically uh, be about these geographies that are mentioned uh, in what were at that point in time, uh, the four different sections, now the, the ADU section and the, the one with three subsections. Um, I don't know what the effect of that would be um, and, and how they've tried to, to carve that out at this point. Uh, Director Sandgren, then Director Speer. I'm actually going to follow up on a question. I think uh, Director Peck was basically indicating the same. So rail, our end line, which has been planned forever but has no actual funding anywhere, is that going to be included? Uh, the station, so like the end line extension, those stations would not be subject to the transit oriented areas provision because it is specifically looking at existing stations. Dr. Spear. Thank you. Um, I just had a question how this relates to some of the policies that were in the mitigation action plan that we approved last fall um, because we basically set in place a process where. In four years, if we're not hitting our greenhouse gas reduction standards as a region, um, some land use oriented policies, some kind of ways to incentivize um, less transportation reliance are going, or sorry, less car transportation reliance will kick in. And are there aspects of this land use bill that relate to that mitigation action plan and the strategies that were implemented there? Yes, in the mitigation action plan, uh, we had closed part of the, the gap that we had to meet, especially by 2030. Um, we had tied those to zoning changes and changes, changes to parking requirements. Um, my initial read is I'm not sure that the parking requirements would be covered uh, by the changes as outlined here, uh, but the zoning changes, it, may, it, may, it would possibly trigger um, so, some acreage to count towards um, our measure, mitigation measures under the, the Greenhouse Gas Mitigation Action Plan. Hey, Director Peck and then Director Wheel. Thank you. Um, this is kind of piggybacks on what Director Mulvey was going, was talking about HOAs. 
Um, uh, what about metro districts? Are they subjected to uh, this plan, even though they are a different governmental? There are some definitions of the, the subject jurisdiction, subject municipalities. If these metro districts were um, in an unincorporated area, uh, they would not potentially be subject, although the, our emerging analysis of the accessory dwelling unit uh, section could come into play uh, with those. Uh, so it really depends on uh, the governmental unit that they're within and whether it's a, a city uh, and, and depending on the size and location. Hey, uh, Director Wheel, then Director Dyack, then Director Ward, then Director Shaw. Thank you. This, I think, kind of ties in with Director Peck's question. There are some fairly large areas on the map that was earlier that are white, of which I assume means, uh, this doesn't apply. And yet, there are also some very small population communities that, that have the same burden of, co of cost and, and overhead associated. Um, and I'm trying to understand, you know. Yeah, I think we've had similar questions speaking to the intent. It's hard for us to, to, to speculate um, why there have been certain jurisdictions that are subject identified as subject municipalities or subject jurisdictions and, and others that, that may not be included. Uh, the, the accessory dwelling unit change that, that we heard about last night um, was one of the first times that we've seen these minimum zoning standards extend in uh, beyond uh, cities and towns. Mr. Dyack. Um, are our transit providers at the table? And I mean, to me, if, if we are building in um, if we're going to require us to build in uh, dens density along transit corridors, I would want to ensure that we require the transit providers to maintain level of service in, um, in those heavily, um, heavily passengered areas, in addition to requiring them to try to bring up level of service in those outlying areas or those areas that are underperforming. Um, just because you create a corridor does not mean that people will use it. I think uh, we need to get them involved to ensure that they um, are buying into this as well. Thank you. Director Ward. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm gonna piggyback off Director Dyack's comment real quick. Um, <clears throat> I think we do need to address aspects of RTD when, as it relates to Title VI concerns, all of this housing that's going to go up would predominantly be market rate, uh, since there's no meat in this bill that would allow us to require affordable housing, 1981 law. Um, and time and time again, we hear, at least I personally hear when I interact, is you know, we can't increase service in your area because you don't have the uh, low-income minority communities. Statistically, there are two areas like Denver and Aurora to increase levels of service. Um, one question I do have, since there's been some I can't keep track, um, have they done anything with the language regarding uh, financially infeasible? They have done something regarding the language uh, re financially infeasible. They've uh, defaulted to language that is more closely associated with zoning variances. I can look it up real quick. Okay. Like, um, yeah, it's like physically impossible or practically difficult. So that wouldn't have any implications if it came to, uh, as it relates to like Broomfield's housing ordinance. If they can't claim financially infeasible for the pay a fee if they don't want to implement uh, affordable or income aligned units. There were some amendments specifically calling out that nothing in this would, would preclude uh, a jurisdiction from um, 
having an inclusionary zoning ordinance. So there were some things made more specific related to that. Okay, thank you. Um, and I just want some clarification as it relates to the uh, density surrounding transit-oriented communities and the sections. Um, some language I've read, and I may be misunderstanding the language, is that it would require up to like 40 dwelling units per acre for TOCs and 25 dwelling units uh, per acre for key corridors, or is that the minimum you have to have at least 20, 40 and 25 respect? That would be um, the 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 lowest maximum that you could put in place. Uh, and it can, with the flexibility provisions around that, it can, it can get confusing because that's an average that folks are trying to meet. We've also tried to explain that very few uh, zoning codes would actually spell it out in those terms. And so some of this calculation could be really difficult because more of our codes are written in terms of setbacks, lot coverage, height, and not in dwelling units per acre. Okay, I guess my only concern with that is the lowest maximum that we are going to require is if we want to go lower, communities will go lower than what that maximum and that defeats the purpose of transit-oriented communities. The, the zoning would still have to allow up to that, but projects could still come in below that level and, and uh, be built. And I have, based on my experience with developers, I have no concern that they would attempt that. Um, and then my last question is going to be around that, uh, the housing, or at least I have a comment around the, uh, the parking minimum or maximums, I should say. When, it, when we allow a developer to allow more than what we maximally allowed in code, it also defeats the purpose of transit-oriented communities. Broomfield has one. Uh, it's our Arista neighborhood surrounding the U.S. 36 uh, Broomfield Station, and we have no parking requirements in that area, and we regularly have developers build past what our code requires in a transit-oriented community. Yeah, the the uh, bill, as, as we've seen it so far, has nothing about parking maximums. There's nothing that would stop a community from putting that in place. Um, we recently had a panel uh, with some communities in the region looking at parking maximums um, and, and how communities are designing those to prevent that kind of situation. But there's nothing in this bill that would, would force anyone to put in place a parking maximum. I'm only mentioning that because in the bill it says you can't require more than half a space per unit it's as a municipality, but developers can opt in to put more. And that's my concern. Yes. They get to decide how much they want, not us. That's correct. Dr. Shaw. Thank you. So my question is, can this housing, as described in the bill, actually serve to sabotage our greenhouse gas mitigation plans because it allows more housing that would be distant from transit. Uh, yes, and, and it would still allow us on paper to meet uh, what we've agreed to in, in that uh, mitigation action plan. Uh, but yes, in terms of how we have to then evaluate performance and success eventually, we may not see the same performance that was expected um, in terms of of how people choose to get around and the, the types of trips they make. Thank you. Dr. Odoricio, and then I'm going to have a couple of questions. Um, I, I know the group, the majority of the folks in here really don't. So I think that part of the conversation also needs to be a recognition that in addition to the questions you might have, we might also need to start brainstorming potential fallback or some recommendations because you may or may not uh, succeed in, in, in stopping this. And I think what's important for us to recognize is the reality of the situation is there's a delicate group of folks, a delicate coalition that came together on this, and it's environmentalists, private sector, and housing advocates. And the housing advocates, of course, are worry about price, affordability, anti-displacement, 
and you look at where the private sector, and they want to make sure that we're not, they're having to fight the anti-growth sentiment that's happening in a lot of our communities. They want to continue growing. Then you look at the environmental folks that want to make sure that we are more efficient with our growth and our land use and to try to reduce greenhouse gases and other pollutions. While I appreciate the fact that we're asking a lot of questions because we need clarity, I also think it's important for us to put on our thinking caps a little bit because if you're going to be stuck with the bill, maybe you need to also, we also need to look at what are some of that menu of options of affordability and what are some other things that if you kind of look at it could be a potential positive redirection or adding things to make this actually work to accomplish those goals that those other groups are seeking. Like, think about why we're in this situation is the triangulation is people are blaming cities and counties, right? And mostly cities in this case. But also think about, like, are there things that you could do if you're worried about parking to say, well, let's talk about it. Maybe we allow parking districts where people can join and get parking done. You know, like, let's get creative. And so while I appreciate the questions, we've got to keep asking those questions, got to get clarity. But the reality is this is moving down the track. And it's going to either pass or it's not. But if it passes, it would be much better if we identify some things because we are saying to the legislators, oh, we're already doing a lot of this. Great. Tell us what should be on that menu of options so you get credit for what you're already doing. And so I just want us to kind of expand our thinking a little bit here and talk about that because there are a lot of things you are doing. And so what we don't want to see is people say, I don't want that RTD route by this community because now it's going to change our zoning, right? I mean, that's what I'm kind of hearing. And I think we're concerned about having 30 people in a home. Well, the issue, if you look at this, the root cause of the concern, is we're changing the dynamic of how we define families anyway. And so, heck, even Three's company had, you know, three adults living together, right? Like, like let's, let's, let's change some of those things that were exclusionary or biased or prejudicial and recognize that and come up with ways to try to help people meet their, these goals and objectives in case you are stuck with a bill that you're going to have to live with. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to ask my questions. So I'm sure I get those in for a second. And then we'll go to uh, Mr. Dyack and Director Mulvey. Um, I sat in the hearing room for most of the public testimony. Uh, feels like a decade ago, but what, last week? Or was, yeah. um, there was a lot of conversation about, oh, there will be amendments that address affordability. Because one of the complaints is, the talk is, this is affordability with the belief that just creating greater capacity automatically means it's going to be cheaper. Um, there was talk of amendments that were going to address affordability. I didn't hear that in what you presented. Were there things in the amendments that addressed affordability? So I think one of the things that addressed affordability was putting in statute that menu of options. And so when you're developing your housing needs assessment or housing needs plan, you need to address and incorporate some of those. So they did try to directly address that. The other piece that I think addresses affordability by looking at uh, what happens to people when they get priced out of communities is the displacement section. So I think the <laughs> intention is that communities should look deeply at how do we, at the same time increasing opportunities for residential development, also address community members that are there now and ensure ways that they, they can remain. And so I think those are, there's those two pieces. Also, I, I don't think this is new, but in the t transit oriented areas, there is that um, carrot per se to be able to build more dense developments if you're bringing affordable um, housing to those developments. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and just two clarifications. So we, we talked about the parking minimums. Uh, it sounds like they are continuing to say in uh, Tier one in general, there can't be a minimum, but there can't be a parking requirement in general. We can't require a builder to have, have parking, yet in the transit corridor, we can require up to half a space per unit. Correct? Okay, great. And then the middle housing, um, there's not a middle housing section anymore, and there's not right by you saying somebody can just put in a sixplex, <coughs> but there is something in there about percent. It, I, I'm not exactly following that other piece, and I don't want to lose the fact that there is still a mandate. The mandate has just changed a bit. Yes. So middle housing is not called out as it's 
um, standalone section, but it is within the corridors and centers section. And it goes from saying that middle housing can be allowed anywhere in a community where you allow single family to saying you have to allow middle housing in at least 30% of the areas where you allow single family. And what it, at least sitting through some of these calls, some of the intent that was explained was that we're really trying to create some flexibility here and allowing communities to be able to identify where are those areas and where are most appropriate in, in, in different communities. Thank you. Director Dyack. Thanks. Um, no, I'm, I'm going to speak to uh, Director Odoracio's comments. Um, you know, I think, I think for some of us, Parker, I, I know at least, is um, the reason why we're asking questions and the reason why we're kind of caught flat-footed is because um, there's really been very little interaction. I mean, a bill's been dropped, they're working it, and you know, usually what you have is you have the ability to interact, to understand, and um, in, in this circumstance, um, the state is taking away or at least heavily modifying our ability to placemake our own communities, um, something we've taken for granted all these decades. And, um, you know, I think we're trying to shake off the, the, the uh, shock and awe of this and trying to understand, and we just don't have time, and we don't have the ability to collaborate with the people who are talking about this and with the people who, who are making these amendments or changes. And, um, you know, to me, I think I, I talked about this in our special board meeting, but um, we need the ability of time. We need the ability to interact with um, the people who, who are talking ab about these amendments or um, presenting this bill and saying, listen, we're, we're doing this. Let's, let's put this, let's park this, and let's, let's figure this out. Because if you pass something, this is, a, this is a shift, a seismic shift, and there are unintended consequences. And to me, I would, I would much rather slow it down and have the ability to, to discuss and collaborate and to try to find common ground um, rather than just saying we have a time limit, we have to pass it. So, I mean, I think that's, that's where, where I'm at, where I think Parker's at, and where maybe some of you guys are at. But um, just figured I'd throw that in there. Thanks. Director Odoricio, are you responding to that specific comment? I'm going to let you skip ahead in line then, so go ahead. I apologize for skipping in front of someone. Uh, I, I actually appreciate that, and I'm not even trying – I mean, I'm president of CCI. We're opposing the bill, okay? And even Adams County, as progressive as we are on, on housing, we're not supporting the bill at this point, okay? We're in an amend. I'm saying that as a belt and suspenders, if your belt – breaks and you can't get the delay or to kill the bill, you should also have some suspenders saying, let's make this more easy for us to be able to work with in case you get it. That's all. So I'm not pushing back on any of the, the concerns. I think it's good that we ask those clarifying questions. It's good that we ask those, but also look at that menu of options because it's somewhat potentially a safe harbor. And if you could get credit for doing some of the things you're doing now that allow you not to have to be subject to some of those other mandatory provisions that you don't like, then make sure those things are on that list. And so I'm just, maybe it's a dose of optimism, you know, but I'm also trying to say that it's also a dose of us doing a little bit of risk management that if, if you're stuck and you don't win, once again, your belt breaks, you still have the suspenders. I, at this point, have uh, Mo Director Mulvey, Director Levy, Director Ward, and Director Vidim, and Director Walton. So if anybody has not commented, raise your hand so we can get you on the list. Otherwise, we're going to need to move ahead here in just a few moments. Director Mulvey. Yeah, I'm always at the table looking for a solution. But what I'm seeing is that there's two components of the bill. One is to mandate um, certain things, and the other is to allow certain things. And, and it's mixed in. But then I, I'm continually drawn to who is this helping or benefiting or hurting, and we have development, which is easy to identify mitigation measures and to find a, a solution that might work, whether it's percentages, quarters, whatever. What I don't see a solution for, and I'm loving to hear it if there is one, is what about the allowance of ADUs, which is a concomitant mandate 
to allow them. So you're in a community which has large enough lots for somebody to build ADUs on either side of their house, no matter how you define it. Well, that property owner purchased because they wanted to be in that community and governed by something. The only way a community with those can opt out is by saying it's that 30% area over there that might not have ADUs or that might not have HOAs that we're going to say, okay, let's do the ADUs over there. Well, now you're putting a more restrictive requirement on people who've already elected to live in a less restrictive community. So I'm not seeing a solution for how you have chosen to be governed on the HOA level and special district service plans is a great, great comment to add to that. How do you deal with those overlapping layers? And if, if there's a conversation about that, maybe, maybe some of this can be pared down. Dr. Levy. Thanks. I'm really glad we're having this conversation. I, I don't think you could find a more diverse group of jurisdictions, and I don't think any of our jurisdictions has supported this bill. And I, I think that actually is an opportunity for us. And I think there are some things um, in this bill that we could all get together around to, to Director Odoricio's point. Um, we have talked around this table for my whole time and probably my predecessor's whole time about the fact that we're, we're not optimizing all the investment we've made in infrastructure, both in, in highways and in transit because of our dispersed development patterns. Um, we've talked about the difficulty in achieving the greenhouse gas emission reduction targets and that um, if we have to use the um, mitigation um, strategies that there's some question as to whether we can actually achieve those reductions because they're voluntary. And I think there are opportunities in this bill to get closer alignment of transportation and land use planning and, and not in a way that undermines the ability of communities to shape their growth. Um, I was really struck by the amendment that um, that Senator Kirkmeyer um, offered. And I think if we, I think we have an opportunity to support that or a variant on that, which um, really directed efforts towards housing needs assessments. Um, I don't think, I, I, you know, I have trouble finding anything wrong with getting a handle on what do we have and what do we need. Um, and that then allowed communities to take the results of those needs assessments and plan accordingly. Um, but also, um, I don't recall actually whether it was zero one zero um, in itself or whether I was thinking you could in, uh, attach zero two four to zero one zero and have a happy marriage. But but I think there are, are some combinations that would get us to where we've got a strong set of state strategic um, priorities. We've got a direction to Dr. Cog and the MPOs to prioritize funding to areas that are achieving those objectives. And we get a, all of our communities get an understanding of what our housing needs are and are given the latitude to plan accordingly. So I think there is a path to get to yes that that we could get out of Dr. Cog. We'll get back to the list here in just a second, but uh, Executive Director Rex and I had this conversation about the, the, the assessment and that asking the question about what's going on, finding out what the issue is, then making your decisions about how you solve that would seem to be the logical approach. To your point, how many of you are in favor of an assessment? Do the study. Okay. Anybody opposed to the assessment piece? Okay. Please. Guys, okay. I'm not opposed to the concept of an assessment. What, what the difficulty I have is that we currently are in the middle of doing a housing assessment. Right. Wheat Ridge has done a housing assessment. Arvada has. We have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on assessments. 
So now we will have the opportunity again. Oh, there, there, and that's, a, that's a great point. That's very well said. But uh, yeah, the, the, the entire assessment piece and being able to use what you've already got versus what needs to happen. But you know, one of the challenges for me with the bill is the bill saying we're going to we've got a problem that we're going to fix in these ways, and then we're going to find out. The problem. Why, uh, it just seems to be very seems to be very yeah seems to be out of out of sequence. Uh, Director Ward, uh, Chair, I think just to kind of push back a little bit on Director Kraft Tharp. Broomfield, for example, we're up for another housing needs assessment update. So at some point, you're going to have to update your assessment anyway. So I don't see, I don't have quite that concern. Um, but I have just one last question I want to ask in regards to infrastructure, specifically water and wastewater. Has the bill addressed who really is responsible for those improvement upgrades when you switch from a single family home to, let's say, a quadplex, for example. Um, our public works department in Broomfield has pointed out that there are some changes that need to occur in terms of the diameter of the pipes to accommodate that. Um, has that bill addressed who's responsible? Slash, can we make the developers responsible for that <laughs> and not have the city be responsible? I'll have, I'll have to double check, but I, I think there are some pieces in there about um, that, that I'd seen some of this come across my screen of uh, impact fees or development fees, things like tap fees. Um, I, I don't think this would preempt any of those. So that would get the developer to pay, I believe. I think that's, that would be much more preferable since most cities don't have the capacity to reallocate money for up zoning. Um, and I personally would not want to pass those costs on to the rest of the system to pay for those. We've already had to deal with that from uh, newer developments currently in Broomfield. Director Vidim and then Director Walton. Director Bidham, I don't think your microphone is on. Well, he doesn't really. Well, true. <laughs> <laughs> He's got that great Can't tell. <laughs> yeah. There you go. There you go. Okay. It's good. Okay. As I was saying, um, Dr. Cog held a special meeting essentially to discuss uh, SB 213. A great debate occurred, a lengthy debate occurred. At the end of that time, a vote was taken. As a result of that vote, a message was sent to the General Assembly from this body that said, we oppose SB 213. Okay, so that's all water under the bridge. My question is, since, since we've already displayed our displeasure with the bill, going forward, what is the role of Dr. Cog? I, I assume you mean related to this bill. Um, I, 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 um, so, you know, when we had that discussion, uh, I think we, we even had a conversation about staying at the table, right, and making sure that our voice was heard and the opportunity, of course, for us to make any changes that, quite frankly, could get us to uh, at a different position. I'm not suggesting that we're there yet, but um, but I think you know I think it is still wise for for Dr. Cog and staff to continue and have those conversations with the state and share these questions, these concerns, these these ideas that this board has about you know about housing in general. And as it re if it relates or gets back into a bill, then that's fantastic. But I you know I think ultimately it is it's about staying at the table, and making sure that our voice is continuing to be heard. Dr. Walton. Thank you. Um, when uh, Director Odoricio was speaking, I think what resonated with me was something that was starting to creep up is, I, when I hear questions asked, I don't know if that is, if, if that's something you're interested in because you are for it or if you are against it, whatever you're speaking about. And so um, if, 
speaking less, so this is maybe too late now. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I hope that um, staff is able to read between the lines of the questions that are being asked as you are at the table. Um, and if there's clarity to be sought or a forum where members and who have staff not at Lafayette that are following this closely, that you are at the table advocating for um, you know, something that perhaps some of us can live with. And if any of you um, can do that on behalf of Lafayette, I just don't know how our staff has any time to be following any of this right now. So I feel a little nervous of kind of just taking what ends up happening. So I appreciate um, the discussion tonight, even though some of it you know, I'm just not reading the fine print to know what it really means and what it means for our community. So I do know that on the first read, uh, the staff at Lafayette felt like we're doing these things. So now you've kind of raised my attention a little bit like, oh, what? OK, maybe I go back to them. What can we make sure is on that list? So but I think that, um, you know, where there are opportunities for Dr. Cog to advocate for this body, all of the diversity that is represented here, but certainly if you, if there are opportunities to follow up um, on specific questions and things you're hearing about, um, um, I'm, I'm happy to connect you with somebody that's maybe got half an opinion on what they've read on the first read, you know, the first <laughs> drop of the bill um, in Lafayette to, um, to help connect that and, and guide how, how you're advocating. Um, I. One thing that caught my attention, um, you mentioned mobile homes, but it was very quick and very fast. And so um, if you could just briefly um, explain again what the, um, it was the mobile home part of the ADU portion or the um, middle? Uh, um, it, it was in a couple sections. Um, I believe it was uh, just in the, Don't believe it was in the added to the ADU section as a, as an exemption. It was specifically called out uh, in the transit-oriented areas and the key corridors. Um, and I think we're still trying to figure out there were not some of the same definitions included in the subsection for middle housing. So we're still trying to trace back what actually an eligible parcel uh, in that section is. So. It, it may apply, it may not. Uh, we're still trying to figure that one out. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Director Starker. <laughs> and we you. will wrap this up, Mama Chair. Uh, okay. Um, as I looked through the through the amendments and tried to read through them this afternoon, um, the there was some phrase, and it looked like uh, de it wasn't deed restricted affordable housing, but there was another there was another containment phrase used that that seemed to be going. That seems to be a new feature of the, of the amendments. Are you are you with that? Yes, and you know what? I am losing track of all the amendments, but one of the terms that did come up in one of the amendments was regulated affordable housing, and I think that might be what what you're referring to. It, it is, and is that is that a new was that a new feature in this amendment cycle? I believe so. Okay. Director Rex has asked for 30 seconds, and I told him he can have 40. <laughs> all right. Well, thank. First of all, thank you so very much for the discussion tonight, and to Director Walton's um, comment and question. And we take the comments that we receive here very seriously, and and I thank you for a little bit of latitude in in uh, in working with uh, the powers to be in order to make sure that our voices are heard. So we appreciate that. I'm really intrigued by the conversation, and and Director Levy mentioned uh, Senator Kirkmeyer's. Um, amendment, which was very intriguing, and it basically, in a nutshell, basically removed a lot of the, the the mandates and required that the needs assessment and plans be established. I was thinking about some. Listen, there's a lot of acrimony around the middle housing piece, in particular. I think, right? I think most people would agree with that. And I've had at least conversations, kind of offline, with some folks about. You know, what if you were to strike that part, right? Are there other ways that we can handle the middle housing piece? For example, can we include it, make a requirement that communities um, address middle housing as part of their housing plan, right? And that way it provides local governments the innovation to be able to decide this middle housing is not lost on y'all, right? I mean, this is, you know, you know, this is an issue and concern and, 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 and work it that way. I just 
think that sometimes, I mean, I'm not saying that this is intentional, but I think the planning process as it relates to this has been, has, has maybe, maybe not given the respect that maybe that it, it, it deserves in this. It's just not sequential, I don't believe, the bill. Thank you. I know that was more than... Oh, you're good. And I'll, I'll, I'll make one more comment. You know, one of the challenges with the bill is the one-size-fits-all that although, okay, well, resorts are now carved out, well, counties have been carved out, well, parts, you know, that, that in theory it is of statewide interest, yet it's not applying to the entire state. And you have a community like mine, and I'll speak about Edgewater ever so briefly, we're less than a square mile. We don't have open lands. We have some of the cheapest real estate in town. And so, and 40% renters which makes us very vulnerable to those parcels being sold out from underneath renters and developed in other ways. We don't have a lot of options in terms of parking. You know, we have businesses that are right next to houses. And so suddenly, if we don't have some degree of ability to regulate parking, then we're affecting the businesses, we're affecting the residents. You know, We've got the situation. The ADU thing, to me, is wild. ADUs are not instantly a solution to, to affordability of housing. They are expensive. They raise the value of that property. They increase more, inc create more landlords conceivably and more tenants, and they, they affect the neighbor's property rates as well. So there are just a lot of assumptions that, that – and that's the frustration that it wasn't the, the, the assessment done first, and then you look at what solutions are. It's like, okay, here's our list of great solutions, and they aren't necessarily that. Anyway, with that – We'll move on. <laughs> Thank you for letting me uh, have that moment. Uh, uh, let's go to Rich Morrow for new bills for consideration and action. As, as Rich is getting these notes together there, I, I will point out that we did send out an addendum to this, our revised uh, listing of bills, which includes 1255, just FYI. Okay, I'll give this a shot. So we have uh, two new bills for you. I'm going to discuss um, House Bill 1243. That's in your packet. And then turn it again over to Sheila to discuss uh, House Bill 1255, the growth caps bill. So House Bill 1243 is one of those occasions, fairly rare occasions, where a bill gets introduced right after the board has already met and um, has almost a month until the board meets again. So the staff in this case, um, and we're reviewing all the bills for you know impact on Dr. Cog in the region and so forth. Uh, in this case, uh, saw uh, some relevance uh, to this bill, to the work of the, of the Area Agency on Aging, and we've engaged on the bill pursuant to prior direction from the board, what's in our uh, adopted policy statement and so forth. Um, the, the Dr. Cock board uh, uh, voted in favor to support a bill that was sort of the first step in this hospital community benefit program back, I believe it was 2019, uh, that required, and it's focused on nonprofit hospitals, uh, which by, by reason of not having to pay taxes, gain a benefit uh, that, uh, say, for-profit hospitals don't. And some of their value is, comes from the fact that they get this sort of subsidy from, from the public, really. Um, and this, there are similar programs in other states, but what was set up was a way to have the hospitals engage with the communities that they serve and sort of give back and work with those communities uh, to develop plans and get input on what kind of investments in, in those communities uh, would be a way to do that. Um, after the number of years of working, um, legislators and others have felt that that program needed uh, a little bit more fleshing out, uh, a little more uh, updating and so forth. And one of the things that they put into this bill for hospitals to consider investing in uh, were the, you know, what we uh, commonly call the social determinants of health, which is, I think Jayla will agree, essentially what the AAA does. That's what we fund. Um, and it's also an area where the AAA here has been working to try to engage hospitals and partner with them in, in various um, uh, ways, which Jayla could probably exp explain better than me if you have detailed questions. But I felt it was a, an opportunity if we could uh, flesh that language out a little bit, because the bill and the, the language in the bill just said, 
uh, social determinants of health, uh, including transportation, housing, and um, what was the other one? Um, I forgot the third thing, uh, nutrition. And um, we got, we, we approached the sponsors, which was essentially uh, the Department of Healthcare Policy and Finance, and said, could we get a little bit of language in there to just make it more clear that we're talking about investments in services, investments to the people in your community uh, that have health-related social needs and that can work, maybe help with the AAA, can help you identify them and identify uh, providers and so forth. And uh, HICPUF was was great. They they uh, said, you know what, that's a really great idea. We're we're glad that you suggested it. They incorporated incorporated our suggestions into the amendment that were adopted in the House committee. The bills passed through the House uh, now, and it's actually scheduled for the Senate committee tomorrow morning. And so anyway, that's basically that bill. And uh, needless to say, we're recommending that the the board support the bill. Questions, comments? Motion to support. Yeah. Director Peck. I move that we support House Bill 1243 as amended. Second. Second. Okay. Can I up front get a raise of hands of anybody that would need to abstain from that vote? Thank you very much. Any discussion on the motion before we have a vote? Okay. Uh, we do need to get a raise of hands uh, so that we can get a, a, a correct count. Uh, those in favor signify by raising your hands. Okay, I think we're good there. Any opposed? Okay. And then we know the number of abstentions. So, Right, motion passes. Thank you very much. And now I'll turn it back over to Sheila. She gets to have more fun. Thanks, Rich. All right, so I was just going to provide an explanation of House Bill 1255. Um, this bill is concerning preemption of local laws that limit um, <coughs> limits on uh, residential development. And the, the bill really calls out that uh, the state has an interest in encouraging housing growth statewide and preempts any existing local housing growth restrictions and forbids the enactment or enforcement of any future local housing growth restrictions. And so essentially what it, the way it, it, it does that is that it puts restrictions on um, Local, local governments putting restrictions on the number of housing, or sorry, building permits or land use applications um, in their communities. They do call out um, temporary anti-growth local laws that would be permissible in, in the case of a disaster emergency, a declared disaster emergency. And so one of the things we wanted to bring up is that um, our colleagues at CCI and CML have been um, talking to the legislators about is um, the concept of moratoriums. Moratoriums can be viewed as temporary anti-growth local laws and that, you know, moratoriums, as we know, are tools for local government as they help local governments in doing a number of things as they consider different regulations or plans. They can allow time to consider stakeholder perspectives in that process. They can also give time to gather data or information in order to make better decisions around a, a, planning, a planning document or a regulation. And so um, we just wanted to highlight that um, this is part of what CCI and CML have been trying to advocate for on this bill. Um, and that really moratoriums, some of the suggestion was um, shorter moratoriums, less than six months. As all of you know, as elected officials in local communities, less than six months, is, it's kind of challenging to, to do stakeholder engagement or some of the other things you might do or the reasons you might put forth a moratorium in less than six months. So six months to a year seems more reasonable to allow moratoriums of that length. The other piece is that um, currently the way the bill is written, it would limit the number of moratoriums a community or a, a local government could um, put forward. And so that is something that 
also is concerning, especially if the moratoriums are for different kinds of policies, different reasons, that there should be greater flexibility to allow more in a five-year period. So that's the overview. I'm sure there are tons of questions. I also just want to um, point out that Rich, Jen, and Ed are all here as well. They probably have more real-time updates than I do, so thanks. Dr. Walton. Thank you. Is there a sunset this bill? No, it does not look like there's a sunset. Shaw. Thank you, Chair. I, I, I guess I kind of struggle with this one because um, I, I'm kind of a free market economy type person. You know, there are a lot of factors that help determine uh, the need for growth, and so, you know, to mess with it is wrong. But it seems to me that in the jurisdictions that have these limitations, the people who live there voted for it. So it also seems to me it should be the people that vote against it if if it's changed. Um, I, I don't know about the legality of of changing it without their vote, but those are my thoughts. And I may lean on others if we want a response to that. I, I do not, but I wonder if Rich or Jen or Ed might want to speak to that. Wonderful, thanks. Good evening, thanks for being here. Director Shaw, your question was more around overturning the will of the voters. You know, in the, in the past, the legislature has been hesitant to do that. Um, it's a little interesting that they're not in this case, um, but that certainly has been a topic of discussion around this bill, especially for the, the three areas that have um, done that. Rex. Thank you so very much. My question is for Jen. Uh, Jen, so has that been raised as an issue about maybe the bill operating going forward versus what has already happened in some cases? There has been a little bit of discussion to not have it be retroactive so that, it, yes, it would then just apply to those entities moving forward. And, I, and that is, is the implication that that is what would happen with this bill. Dr. Walton. And so when would the, um, if passed, when would it be go into an effect? Um, I, let me, it, it has a petition clause, so that means it would likely go into effect sometime in um, August, so 90 days after the governor signs it. And we're already so late in session, I would assume that this bill would fall within the 30-day clock. So sometime in August. Yeah, in Lafayette, um, the voters um, have supported growth management. Um, we are... Um, it's been done in six-year periods, and so it, we're in a cycle now where that would be expiring, and we would be putting something on the ballot again for voters to consider. Um, where we are in our our growth um, and potential build out, I've been really advocating for a robust debate and and conversation um, presented to council for consideration of the pros and cons um, and not just assuming that we should do it again. Um, so I'm, I'm, I would um, would probably be opposed to a bill like this um, because I would be, um, to Director Shaw's point, interested in that being a decision that residents make. Dr. Ward, Dr. Lance. Thank you, Chair. I just have one statement about this particular bill. I personally support it. I will have to abstain because our council has taken a monitor. Um, but we all talk about how we have an affordability problem. We have a housing problem. We don't have enough units coming in. Growth caps are a part of that problem. You are arbitrarily setting how many units are going to come into your community. And we're not those communities that do have them, 
whether they're voted in or like Broomfield was with our our council implemented one, but we were able to skirt around those for decades. <laughs> um, you're not helping the problem. You're being part of the problem. And I think this bill is an attempt to rectify some of those issues. Mr. Chair, may I make one clarification? Please. Thank you, Director Shaw. I was incorrect. Um, that was a proposal for an amendment to the bill that it would not um, apply to those three municipalities that have already passed growth restrictions, um, but it would just be for those moving forward. That was an amendment idea that was rejected. This bill does say explicitly that it would prohibit any local government from enacting or enforcing. So it would apply to the three. My apologies. So this seems to me another similar bill to our Senate bill, which is taking over control from home rule. And it really takes away any of the ability of the city to manage and contain and grow in the manner that's appropriate for the citizens uh, that live in that community. Uh, we all are facing different housing needs, uh, some more than others, and it's the community that should take it and proceed on a path that's appropriate for them. Director Teal. Thank you, Chair. So, um, uh, well, Douglas County, is a, we took a position on this one. And um, I'm, I'm sure some will find it humorous in the room that we would oppose growth caps in Douglas County. And philosophically, we do. We, uh, I think uh, several of the directors made comments about it really should be in the, the, the choice of the local communities to control growth as they see fit. But then there's something very practical in terms of the language uh, that's used because our staff kind of called out there's a problem here. Um, we do control growth in Douglas County, but we do it with our master plan that defines uh, allowable zones um, essentially south of the town of Castle Rock in an effort to preserve our pastoral agrarian economy and culture in the south half of the county. For those of you who might think that sounds a little too academic, um, I would just invite you to someday drive down South I-25 until you hit the second county line road on uh, a town called Monument. And if you drive east or west on County Line Road, you will see high den uh, uh, suburban density housing to the south. And then you will see open agrarian pastoral rangeland to the north. So that is how we have controlled um, in, to, in order to preserve uh, our agricultural area in the county. Otherwise, as a uh, colleague from business once uh, proposed, we should be like we should be like Seattle and Tacoma, and we should have built Denver International Airport in Douglas County so that we could have a SeaTac. Uh, 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 uh. He was Canadian, by the way. <laughs> He's good people. He was. He was. Director, so we'll, we will uh, just to reiterate, Douglas County will be uh, asserting an opposed position. Director Peck. Thank you. Um, I have to admit I did not read 1255, so my question might have already been answered. Um, the one thing in both of the bills we're discussing is that we aren't really talking about capping growth because of water. And um, my fear in both of these is that are we, are we going to a place where if municipalities, counties that have water have to share our water and give it away? And I, I, that is my fear, is that we are not really taking into effect natural resources and how the diverse areas of our state are not all the same. And um, so that, that's, we're going to oppose it. We haven't discussed it on our council, so I won't be voting for it. But um, does this bill address that at all? Good evening, everybody. Um, I don't think it does in its introduced form, but potentially in the amendments. I don't think there's anything in there about sharing water, but whether it would allow a, a local government to prohibit development if it didn't have the water is different, and I don't know that it addresses that specifically. 
I, I think that would be a very important part. I know that in Longmont, with a, a developer has to bring the water with them. <laughs> they on their back. <laughs> <laughs> they have to swim. Yeah. So um, that is, I'm really concerned about that as we move forward. That that might be some of the uh, anti-growth sentiments. They just don't have the resources. Thank you. Other comments, questions, Director Mulvey. A lot of what's been thought of, Commissioner Teal just brought up, and so did um, Mayor Lentz. We do master plans and comprehensive plans, and in a high growth location, our master plan and comprehensive plan allows for density along the highway, business, open space, water, affordability, we've already done that. And so maybe we haven't completed all of the components for some of this, but the idea of self-governance that a lot of us are already doing should not be overridden by, and we've all said what's different. I've been listening, we're all different. So why should we homogenize? It seems discriminatory to do so. The comments? Is there any interest in a motion of some sort? Asking for a motion? Director Teal. Well, Chair, if it pleases the board, uh, per my earlier comment, uh, I do propose a motion to oppose House Bill 1255. Second. second. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? <clears throat> I, can I get by show of hands the folks that would need to abstain? Oh. <laughs> and we're after the, we're, we're trying to know in advance who will have to abstain. I was distracted by my neighboring. <laughs> And, and, and just so everybody understands, if, if you haven't been through this process before, our threshold for approving or you know, either recommending support or oppose has to do with, with the, the numbers of people that will vote. So that abstention number changes the math for Melinda as she, as she goes through this. So that's why we're asking for that up front. I know it seems a little odd, but that's helpful in the process. With that said, all in favor, please signify, all in favor of opposing. Raise your hand. Okay, all opposed to the motion. Okay. Okay. Uh, the motion passes, so uh, we take a, an opposed stand on that. Uh. Bill, thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. While, while you're up there, do you have any general updates for us? Any information you want to be sure we know? Happy day, Happy day 101. When's this punishment done? <laughs> First two. Thank you so much. Can I ask one quick question? I'm so sorry. Uh, Jan, with regards to 213 now, as far as the path next, my understanding is it's going to appropriations next. That hasn't been calendar or anything yet, has it? Friday morning. Oh, it has. Most likely. Oh, most likely. Yes. Yep, and then that means it'll most likely then be on uh, the floor, the Senate floor, early next week. Okay. Is what we anticipate. Great, thank you. Yep. Yep. Very much. With that, we will move ahead on the agenda to the informational briefings, and we will start with, hey, Sheila, you're back, uh, uh, the SB 23-213 story map. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. Well, this is something I'm really excited to share about because this is an opportunity for us to highlight an incredible team at Dr. Cog. Our geographic information systems team is really, maybe I'm biased, but I think one of the best in the state. Um, and 
One of the things that we wanted to highlight, because it's related to Senate Bill 20, uh, 213, is we tried to start doing some mapping to understand how do we apply what's in this bill geographically. And so what we wanted to do tonight is just to showcase a story map that Rachel and others from the team helped develop to not necessarily do in-depth analysis. And as we have mentioned before, we've had all of about two weeks to put this together. So it's been a pretty quick process, but to really just start understanding when you look at what's proposed in the policy, what does this look like across our region? And so we thought it'd be really helpful for Rachel to walk through the story map, map, show you how it works, and then you can certainly ask questions. So take it away, Rachel. As much as you hate these mics, I hate that one more. <laughs> hate it. You got a technically common person here. Oh, I just got the battery back. Whatever works. Hello. All right. There we go. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Piersdorf. I'm a GIS specialist for Dr. Cog, and I won't take up too much of your time. We're just going to walk through this story map really quickly. Um, so, the, and the link um, I think you should all have in the board agenda. So, this page uh, is designed to be scrolled through vertically, but as you can see, you can also jump to specific areas you might be interested in using these headings across the top. So, we start off looking at this, and that is not the right page. One moment. Okay, there we go. We start off looking at the state as a whole, and we have plotted um, all of the census designated places in the state. That includes both incorporated and unincorporated places. As you continue down, that breaks down into those different designations, and then we also overlay the census, uh, 2020 census urban areas. Continuing down, we then have, as you're probably familiar with seeing, each uh, municipality color-coded by the category they're given in the bill. And I'll just say up front that everything in the story map is, um, as the bill was introduced, doesn't have the information um, from amendments currently. And all of the maps in, um, in this page are interactive, which means you can zoom in, uh, move around and click on anything on the map to see some more information about it. So continuing on, we also add the boundaries of the five MPOs in the state. And again, you can click on these, zoom around um, to whatever area you might be interested in. But as we're Dr. Cog, uh, the rest of the maps here will focus on that area. Um, so each of these maps also has a legend in the lower left corner to help you out. And then we walk through the definitions of the tier one and tier two urban municipalities. Next up, uh, it walks through each of the major policy areas, including um, some text that'll probably be familiar to you from Sheila and Andy's past presentations, including some information on exempt parcels at the start here. And then each, each each heading here will have the, the subject locations for that policy area, again, as introduced, as well as some key minimum standards. So as it scrolls through, the map will move around a little bit. This one zooms to the west a little just to, you know, situate us in context of those rural resort job centers are not within our boundaries, but right outside. For the transit-oriented areas, we're showing our existing rail lines and, and the half-mile buffer around each of the stations. And if you want to see exactly where those stations are, you can zoom in and the labels will pop up uh, for more context. And obviously, part of this um, policy area is the parcel definition. So once you scroll onto the next slide, um, you'll see that we've added those parcels. Um, and these are parcels with at least 25% of their area 
within the half mile buffer. And if you need more information on those, again, you can zoom all the way in and the, you'll be able to see the aerial imagery as a base map and click on parcels to see more details about them. For the key corridors, um, since some of these uh, plan definitions have changed and we didn't have exact definitions as we were developing, um, we plotted the current high frequency transit service as well as the current and planned bus rapid transit. So for the current high frequency transit service, um, we selected RTD routes that have a 15 minute headway for some portion of their route for some portion of a weekday. And then we buffered those to um, a quarter mile. For BRT, we included the existing flat iron flyer route as well as the other proposed future routes. And these were buffered to a half mile. And down here at the end, again, this will probably look familiar from Sheila and Andy's presentations, just some more details about the needs assessments, um, key roles, things like that, other components of the bill. Um, and you can view this on uh, mobile devices, tablets, um, but if you're expecting it to look exactly like this, it'll probably be best on a desktop. Um, so yeah, throughout we just tried to add the data layers that would provide the most helpful context to all of you um, without over cluttering the map. <laughs> so yeah, that is all I have for you. Thank you, Rachel, very much. Um, Chair Conklin is not in the room. I, are there any questions? Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Director Cocker. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This is such a fabulous resource. We have a lot of questions in our community about this, and so I plan to just direct them to this. Um, when Do you have any expectation of when it might be updated to reflect the amendments that they're throwing at you constantly? Yeah. Um, I think Sheila might have a better answer for that. Yes. Um, good question. We've talked a lot about what's reasonable, what can we actually get done. I think we're waiting until second reading um, before we'll move forward with amendments only because things continue to shift as we go. So um, we, I don't know if anybody else has an anticipation of when that would be, second reading. Next week sometime. Maybe even as early as Monday. And, and director, if I, if I may, I mean, that, that was specifically the reason why we built this map. We thought it would be a very useful tool for you and your, and your staffs. I mean, it's really interesting when you start, because we, you know, we, we had some original conversations with some directors about, you know, can we get a map that actually shows all just, just the residential zoned areas without our region? And I don't know if you all know this, but you don't necessarily use the same zoning codes. None of you do. <laughs> so it made it very difficult. But what this allows you to do is within your own entities, you're familiar with those zoning codes and allows you to be able to, you know, to identify what they are. So um, it's a pretty cool thing. And Rachel done a tremendous job. And Jenny Wallace, her manager, is in back. She's, they're just wonderful. They do great work. Oh. On again? All right. So in, in your packet, in your packet, the, on, um, and the agenda item, in the attachments, it's the first attachment. It's a link. Will it be on our regular website? Wait. We, we haven't discussed whether it would be on our regular website, but potentially we could. Yeah, I mean, we could do that for sure, especially when we update it now after second reading. Dr. Walton. It says I'm clicking on this piece of paper and it is not opening. <laughs> Click harder. <laughs> harder? Just, you got to get just the right tap. <laughs> you know, when you, you watch your dad poke it. <laughs> but I would also advocate I'm happy to bring my computer and not have a time in my sustainability. For Dr. Odorizio. I want to thank uh, Dr. Cog's staff because I think this is going to be helpful for us uh, as individuals as well as a group to say, is is the bill at any given time once we get it updated as scary or not as scary as we think it might be? And then also identify those areas where there's stations where you're like, 
we don't have housing here. It's industrial or we have, you know, and so I think this will help really visualize those areas and highlight some of those other changes that, again, belt and suspenders, if you can't kill it, you might also have to put in some things where you're like, okay, there's some areas that we need to say that simply cannot be housing. And it might be like, oh, look, they've got this potentially applicable for middle housing or whatever it is here, but maybe there's issues of flood, um, brownfield, uh, and even just like industrial or, or no water in the case of Thornton. Yes. So uh, I, I appreciate this tool. I think it's going to be helpful and it really helps hit home. I, I think good, good policy is based on good data and good information. So thank you, Dr. Cog. The comments, questions? I, I just have one further comment, sure. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, so, you know, if there are other layers as you begin to play with this or your staff, begins to play with that you think might be useful that we might have readily available or you might help us in attaining that, that obtaining that data, um, we'd, be, we'd welcome that, that conversation too. So we want to make this the best tool possible. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Incredible tool. Can I kick a hornet's nest here and say maybe someday in the future we do think about having either some sort of discussion about zones where it doesn't have to be anyone changes any of their zones, but like some sort of like Rosetta Stone to help say like A1 here is equal to A2 here versus, you know, just so Dr. Cog can actually, you know, do that planning so they're comparing apples to apples. It'd be a project, huge project down the road, but I could see a lot of benefit down the road to doing something like that. Outstanding. Thank you. Uh, we'll move ahead. The way to go program update, Nisha. <laughs> Nisha, I didn't want to destroy your last name. Can you do me a favor when you're up there? I, I will not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Promise. I apologize. <laughs> Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you all for your time tonight. Um, can everyone hear me okay? All right, my name is Nisha Mokshagundam, and I manage the Way to Go program. And uh, very excited to talk to you tonight about two big initiatives that our team is working on right now. Um, so I am just going to kind of go ahead and get started. Um, <coughs> all right, so in this presentation, as I mentioned, I'll talk about two big programs that Way to Go is working on, but I did want to start things out by talking about who Way to Go is what we do and who we work with. Um, I'll talk about the work that way to go does with employers in the region um, and how we really entice commuters using an incentive or rather many incentive programs um, and we entice them to participate in eco-friendly commuting through these programs. Um, we're going to review the web and media plan for a new campaign that we've launched um, that is based around a new tax incentive that went into effect in January 2023 and then we will pivot to a very fun update about Bike to Work Day, which is coming up this June. Um, throughout this presentation, I am going to be offering suggestions and just advice for ways member governments can get involved in both of these initiatives. So I wanted to start by talking about the Way to Go program. Uh, Way to Go is actually a partnership between Dr. Cog and eight transportation management associations throughout the nine county Denver metro. <coughs> And our goals are very simple. We like to reduce the number of single occupant vehicles on the road to reduce traffic congestion and also improve air quality. So those are really the, the core benefits of the work that we do. Um, as far as our funding, our program is funded through federal dollars through the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Grant. Um, and we, we work very closely with many stakeholders throughout the region. In addition to those transportation management association partners, we also work with advocacy groups like Bicycle Colorado and also other transportation agencies like CDOT and RTD. And way to go has been managing a voluntary effort for many years, and we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like as far as how people can engage with our program. So this slide highlights way to goes coverage area. Um, you can see about eight blue sections. This is where our transportation management associations operate. And then any area that is not covered in blue is actually managed by my team of outreach specialists here at Dr. Cog. 
And so to talk a little bit about how we operate, how we get people to get those single occupant vehicles off the road, uh, we really manage a number of incentives, both for in, uh, commuters as well as employers. Um, so we like to encourage commuters to try commute modes other than driving alone. And we do this through a series of campaigns, including some really fun events. I mentioned we'll talk about Bike to Work Day. We just wrapped Winter Bike to Work Day in the middle of February. Um, we've got some other campaigns as well geared toward uh, employers like the GoTober program. And the one I want to talk about today is Colorado Clean Commute. Um, so Colorado Clean Commute is actually an initiative that we launched several months ago, or really just a few months ago, I should say. And the intention is for us to use this campaign, a marketing and certification campaign, to help um, employers in the region find eco-friendly commute modes that are also eligible for this tax incentive that went into effect in January. Um, so I wanted to just talk very quickly about what this marketing campaign is all about. So Colorado Clean Commute, as I mentioned, was developed as a campaign to support the Alternative Transportation Options <laughs> Tax Credit or House Bill 22-1026. <coughs> um, I don't want to get into the specifics about the tax incentive just yet. We'll get there eventually. Um, but I did want to talk about the process of getting certifi certified as a Colorado Clean Commute approved business. Um, so the process takes three steps. It's very easy and fast. Um, the first step is for an employer to take a quick three-page assessment. And this assessment, which is uh, hosted online on our My Way to Go platform, it helps us assess what transportation amenities the employer is currently offering. Um, at that point, a Way to Go commute consultant, whether it's from Dr. Cog or one of our Transportation Management Association partners, will get in touch with that employer, and we will encourage them to survey their workforce. Um, this survey, again, a short survey, but it helps us assess a couple of things. It helps us assess what transportation options employees are currently using. So um, from, you know, sort of identifying what people are using and even asking, asking aspirational questions about what commute modes they would be willing to try, we're able to do that third step, which really rounds out the, the three-step program. And that is for the outreach specialist or the commute <coughs> consultants, as we're also called, to deliver this employer a commute reduction plan. Um, this commute reduction plan is filled with um, recommendations for amenities and transportation benefits that the employer can roll out. And once we've delivered that commute reduction plan, we can consider this employer clean commute approved. So at that point, they earn this marketing certification, and they will earn some kudos from Dr. Cog and way to go. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the marketing that we've been doing to highlight the benefits of this program. So we developed this lovely um, landing page. And in addition to the landing page, which talks at a very high level about the tax benefits as well as the benefits of being an employer who supports air quality in the region, um, this, we also launched a series of media ads. Um, the media ads are really fun. Most of these are digital and um, launched um, mainly through LinkedIn. And we like to use LinkedIn for this campaign because it allows us to target employers based on job role, um, and, and also company size. So we've been able to find a lot of great people to respond to this, um, to this initiative. So we also made some enhancements to the mywaytogo.org platform. This is our trip planning and pla my gosh, my, our trip planning and tracking app. Um, so this is what commuters can visit in order to put in their start location, their end destination, and find a series of eco-friendly routes. But we have actually enhanced this platform to create an, an even more robust portal for employers to visit. Um, as employers go through this process, the Colorado Clean Commute approval, um, actually taking that assessment will facilitate the creation of this private portal that employers can then use to see a visualization of what transportation benefits they already offer. They'll see this really cool infographic that shows them what their employees are interested in. So what percentage is using what transportation mode today? And there may even be some additional information about what would, um, what would be an attractive or a desirable transportation mode for that same workforce. So lots of information will be available at a glance to employers 
once they enter this portal, which again um, is automatically created by the submission of the employer assessment. Right. So now we can talk a little bit about eligibility. Um, the vast majority of the recommendations that we include in our trip reduction plan are eligible for this tax refund. Um, so you can see here uh, that this bill is eligible um, for 2023 and 2024. And it allows employers to claim a tax credit of up to 50% of their investments for eco-friendly commuting solutions and um, the cap for the number of dollars they can receive back is 125000 so they can claim up to 250 in expenses. So really uh, great for businesses. We think this is a really big carrot, and we hope that a lot of um, organizations will take advantage of this. Wanted to talk a little bit about the intention of the bill. Um, sponsors really stated that their intention was to decrease traffic and improve air quality by removing some vehicles from the roadway. So as such, eligible expenses include things like staff time to administer transportation programs, um, the purchase of transit passes, uh, infrastructure and costs related to carpool and vanpool and, and a lot more. I do want to make one quick note. Uh, the Department of Revenue hasn't yet finalized its rulemaking for this, for this bill. There are a couple of open questions around additional eligible items, um, but this is what we know. So um, I do want to mention that if any of you have in your jurisdiction have staff who are working on transportation benefits, transportation options for staff under this bill, you should be able to apply for that tax credit. Um, once all of the rulemaking is better defined, we're hoping that we can roll out a lot more information to municipalities and employers throughout the region. So I wanted to show this somewhat outdated snapshot of Colorado Clean <coughs> businesses. So I had to submit this presentation about a week ago. And as of Friday, City of Westminster has been added to this list. So um, thank you, City of Thornton, City of Englewood, City of Longmont, and City of Westminster for getting involved in this program. Um, we're really excited to have member governments involved in this. Um, and if any of you are with the jurisdiction that currently offers commute benefits to your employees, you may very well be eligible to be Colorado Clean Commute certified. So please get in touch with me and we will put you through this process. We will highlight you on our website and shout outs in social media and let the, let the whole jurisdiction <coughs> know um, that you care about air quality. So just wanted to quickly recap, what are those three steps to get Colorado Clean Commute approved? Very simple, take an assessment, um, survey employees, and then talk to a way to go consultant about a commute reduction plan. I would like to ask each of you to reach out to a business in your community and recommend that they get involved in Colorado Clean Commute, and we would be happy again to highlight those businesses and their successes. That's all on the alternative transportation options tax credit and Colorado Clean Commute, but I did want to pause for any questions. All right, in that case, we can go ahead and move on. All right, so bike to work day. I think everybody here is most likely familiar with this but I will waste your time and talk a little bit about the history and background of the event. Um, so we also like to call Bike to Work Day the most fun day in Denver. And I do want to, in this um, the rest of this deck, talk about ways that you can get your member government involved and also other businesses and organizations in your jurisdiction. So what does everyone think of the artwork this year? Isn't it beautiful? Excellent, yes. Um, I, I really wanted to highlight the design today because I think it's inclusive in a lot of ways. Um, we wanted to remind residents of a couple things, especially post-pandemic. We know that not everybody is riding to work every day. A lot of people have adopted uh, flexible commute um, schedules. They are maybe teleworking many days. So we wanted to be inclusive of those residents who are not necessarily riding to work. So there's not a whole lot of emphasis in our theme this year that tells people they've got to go to the office. Just swap a car ride for a ride on your bike on June 28th, and you're really following the spirit of the event. Also just wanted to highlight 
you know, riding your bike is really fun. So that's what the emphasis here on Joyride is all about. We want people to enjoy riding their bikes, and we really want June 28th to be a happy, fun day. So we really hope that the theme, which is super colorful, um, which kind of conveys movement, we hope that this theme really gets people excited about the event. I did want to talk about a couple of um, important dates. So what we'll talk about today in terms of ways that jurisdictions and businesses can get involved are business challenge and station organization. Um, business challenge registration opened back in March. We really wanted um, businesses to be able to register for the event before rider registration opened this Monday on April 7th. And then station registration, stations are really rider appreciation tables where uh, riders can stop off. That, um, that registration opened in March as well, and we will be uh, entertaining new station registrations until the day before the event on June 27th. And then the most important event date is June 28th. That is the day that Bike to Work Day takes place. It is the fourth Wednesday in June in 2023. So here I'll talk a little bit about what it means to participate in the business challenge or to host a rider appreciation station. So participating in the business challenge is really easy. The business challenge really just gives way to go an opportunity to ask all of you for help promoting Bike to Work Day. But we'll do it in a way where you can all get credit for that too. So I want to talk a little bit about how you can sign up. Um, just visit the biketoworkday.co website. You'll see a button that says registration at the top of the site. Click that and click register your business. Um, and by register your business, I will ask you all to register you, your municipalities. Tell us about how many people you have working for you, and that will automatically enter you into the business challenge. Um, then whenever a staff member registers to ride on June 28th, and they select your member government from their list of employers, you will actually climb up that leaderboard. Um, it's a public-facing leaderboard, and all of those um, organizations that top the leaderboard in one of five size categories at the end of the event will be recognized in an ad buy on the Denver Business Journal. You'll get lots of shout-outs on social media um, and tons of recognition from the Way to Go team and Dr. Cog. Um, we have also done um, some really nice catering, and um, ha we've hosted some breakfast for employees of companies who have won as well. So it's also a nice way to recognize all of those people who have um, been so dedicated and participated in the event. So hosting a station is another way that you can get involved in the event. Um, I really encourage member governments to host rider appreciation stations. A um, couple ways you can do that. You can set up a table right outside your headquarters. Um, you can work with the local municipality. Um, just make sure you fill out any you know, necessary permitting, but you can set up a station um, by a bike path or anywhere where you see a whole lot of bike traffic. Um, and there are a lot of benefits to hosting a station. Uh, we do ask that you staff stations with volunteers, probably from your organization. Um, but it's a really nice way to welcome riders to your station to learn about your business if you offer them water, refreshments, snacks. Um, again, it's just a great way to show your appreciation to the community, again, and your support for eco-friendly commuting. The last tip I will offer is you can sponsor Bike to Work Day. Um, I do want to shout out City of Sheridan, one of our sponsors for 2023. Um, there are lots of benefits of sponsoring Bike to Work Day as well, either by sponsoring through a cash donation or an in-kind donation or a combination of both. Um, depending on the amount, we will blast your logo on our owned media, social media. We may even put your logo on our T-shirts, select event signage, and other materials that we use to promote the event. Um, so if you are interested in sponsoring Bike to Work Day. If you want your logo on that t-shirt, please do reach out to me and we will be happy to talk to you about sponsorship options. So this is the fun part. Um, we use that sponsorship funding. So whether those are in-kind or cash donations, we use that sponsorship funding to get a lot of items that will entice people to register to ride. Um, really, really excited that one of our sponsors this year, REI, has agreed to give away a turn e-bike 
to one grand prize winner. So everyone who registers on the biketoworkday.co website will be um, automatically entered into this drawing. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Cog's staff cannot win, um, but that, that is really the only parameter here. Um, so we will select one grand prize winner on June 29th, the day after the event, and they will win this great e-bike. Um, but you can see we're also giving away a lot of cool stuff. And we selected these prizes, especially because we feel like they would appeal to both seasoned as well as new cyclists. So that's all I have um, on Bike to Work Day. But if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much. And, and Doug checked for me. So this, just to clarify, this has the business challenge registration closed April 14th. But it sounds like that's actually kept open. So if you see the April 14th date in there, don't let that dissuade you from, from getting a business you know, signed up for that. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. We definitely encourage businesses to sign up before rider registration opened. The benefit of registering your business before that April 17th date is your business is already in the drop down. If you sign up late, however, and you feel like you've got lots of staff who have uh, registered already, reach out to us. We can help you reconcile that and build up your points on the leaderboard. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Questions? Thank you very much. Fantastic. Great presentation. Uh, you'll note in your packet informational items, there's the administrative modifications to the 2022-2025 Transportation Improvement Program. No presentation on that, correct? Informational in the packet, so you've got that. We'll then move on to committee reports. I request that these reports be brief, reflect decisions made, and information germane to the business of Dr. Cog. We'll start with Mr. Uh, Director Williams, a uh, report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The stack met earlier this month. No action items, but two uh, information items germane to this group. Uh, first up, a update on the revitalizing main streets and multimodal option uh, funding program uh, updates uh, on that. Um, uh, these programs are moving forward uh, in the July-August timeline uh, uh, after awards for the fiscal 23 MMOF project status. Uh, CDOT will begin providing the risk level assessments for this. Dr. Cog is aware uh, of these deadlines, these spending deadlines, taking into account and consulting with project uh, awardees as we move through this. Uh, second up was uh, freight plan overview. So this is the process to develop the next statewide freight plan. Uh, this is going to occur between basically now and uh, March 24. Uh, CDOT then will follow that with an implementation plan from March 24 through the March 2025. Uh, and Dr. Cog again is uh, coordinated and receiving briefings on this as it goes. End of report. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Great. Next up, Mayor uh, Wheatridge Mayor Bud Starker reporting for the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Director Starker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, caucus met on uh, April the 12th. Our first item was a uh, download on Proposition 123 by Mo Meskel and uh, Connor Everson from DOLA. And uh, we also had Geraldine Francis with Chapa to talk about how, um, how Prop 123 was um, being set up to roll out. So we took some questions and had some good information on that. Our second uh, item of discussion was uh, Senate Bill 213, the land use discussion. We had a robust discussion uh, talking about um, all of the issues that we've discussed tonight. So that, uh, with that concludes my report. I'll take any questions. Questions? Thank you very much for that report. Next up, uh, County Commissioner Jeff Baker from Arapahoe County giving the report from the Metro Area County Commissioners. Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mac will meet this Friday here at Dr. Cog. We will be talking about housing, of course, and uh, Boulder is, is uh, facilitating the discussion and we're gonna be reporting on um, some homework that we were given to come back and report. So we'll be meeting on Friday. Thank you, that's my report. Any questions? Hey, thank you very much for that report. Next up, the report from the Advisory Committee on Aging, Shayla Sanchez-Warren. Good evening. Uh, so we put out an RFP for uh, contractor services for area agency on aging and then transportation funds. Our two separate committees reviewed those, scored those uh, proposals. Uh, the, the advisory committee on aging reviewed those recommendations 
and then um, forwarded those to the uh, Finance and Budget Committee who voted on those tonight. So that was a, a big part of the meeting. And then um, uh, I, I presented to them the uh, overview of the four-year plan on aging, which I gave to you the month before because I was supposed to give it to them first, but I got COVID. So then you had it and then they got it. And that was a, it's a long presentation, but I had to go over every piece because it's required by the state. So that's my report. Thank you very, very much. Uh, next up, report from the Regional Air Quality Council, Doug Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. The, the RAC met on uh, its regular meeting on Friday, April 7th. We had a number of presentations, and I'll just highlight two. Um, one was a, a, a presentation on the development of the 2023 severe ozone SIP. You may recall last year there was some um, some necessity to update several chapters in the, in the SIP, so we're going through that process right now. Uh, as well as there was a presentation by Tom Moore, the RAC, and Robert Spots, our very own, about the Climate Action Planning Initiative. And uh, we have the full support and endorsement of the RAC for Dr. Cog uh, coordinating that endeavor. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Next up, report from E-470 Authority, Deborah Moldy. Director Moldy. I muted myself. When there are always a lot of action items which bear very little interest to this group because they relate to data, customer service contracts, and construction and management contracts. The most interesting thing was the crash analysis was completed. There's a lot of good information there. It's not an overly dangerous highway. The construction <laughs> of the new interchanges will be present to anybody who drives the highway. There's a lot of changes there. Um, or just below the airport in the uh, Aurora area. So drive carefully. It's all going very smoothly. Great, thank you. A report from CDOT, Darius Pakbaz. Uh, not too much to report tonight. I uh, did want to remind uh, the board that it is Work Zone Awareness Week. So as the construction season gets started, uh, we wanted to remind all the drivers on the road to drive safe through our construction zone. So, and that's my report for this week, Chair. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And report from RTD, Brian Welch. Mr. Welch. Good evening. Three quick things from RTD. We have a code of conduct that, w that has been released for public review. You can go in on the website. There's a quick survey to take. Many of you in your jurisdictions, your uh, law enforcement officers help us, and we really appreciate that. Next thing is the system-wide fair study and equity analysis, which has been released for public review. We will have four virtual public hearings, two in English, two in Spanish, two in-person open houses, 10 community events throughout the district, including many of your communities, and finally, eight pop-up events throughout the community. We are going to ensure that we get plenty of information and input before the Board of Directors takes action in July. And finally, the Call for Projects Partnership Program is underway. We look forward to accepting projects from our five regional service Sub-regional service councils, which includes all of you, one way or the other, that will happen in June. Any questions? Questions. Awesome report. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, next business meeting is May 17th. The work session <laughs> meeting is May 2nd, May 3rd. I'm sorry, May 3rd. Uh, any other matters by members? Parking validation, very important. Good reminder. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> with that, thank you all. Thank you for your efforts, and thank you, staff. It's an honor working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Same to you, Commissioner. Oh, you're going to take that? I'm going to pass. Oh. <laughs> Pass it down to Melinda. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It is.